Not having access to clean water, it's the biggest killer of children under the age of five. It's a huge problem. It's also one we know how to fix. Hannah Bellamy is the managing director of Charity Water. She's here to talk about her mission for everyone to have clean, safe water, as well as what it takes to run a charity. We want to bring clean, safe drinking water to every person on the planet. Pound, that will generate approximately 1,300 litres of clean water for somebody in one of these countries. It's women who are really impacted by not having clean water because they're the ones who will walk for miles to get dirty water for their families. Not having access to clean water increases the chance of domestic violence. Her home life with her husband was better because he no longer beat her, because she wasn't spending so long collecting water. What are the main challenges of creating more clean water in these areas? Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. If you're a regular here, there's a very easy way to show your support and to help us grow. Download the Fountain app on your mobile, follow Anatomy of a Leader with Maria Vorostovsky, and just start listening. You can share your thoughts on this episode by sending a boost. It's like a payment with a message. And see what other listeners have to say or create clips that you could share with others. Getting started is super easy and you can top up your Fountain wallet with your bank card. Oh, and you can also earn rewards by listening to the Fountain app too. It's seriously a no brainer. Follow the link in the show notes or visit fountain.fm to find out more. Hannah, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Really good to meet you. You too. You're the MD of Charity Water. First of all, please tell me what is Charity Water for those that don't know? Yeah, of course. So Charity Water, it's almost what it says on the tin. We are a non-profit organisation and we want to bring clean, safe drinking water to every person on the planet and for them to have access to that and have it reliable and just like you and I do, we can turn on the tap and we can access clean water. So right now, 703 million people don't have that. Um, And actually not having access to clean water, it's the biggest killer of children under the age of five. And for me, it's mind-blowing that this issue exists. So Charity Water is here to solve it. Um, And we do it in partnership with local organisations. So we are really active across um, the US, across Europe. We're fundraising. And then we empower local people, local organisations to fund the solutions, to do all the work themselves. Um, And 100% of all the funds we raise publicly. So if somebody went on our website today and gave to Charity Water, we would give that to our local partners. So we're a really different charity in that sense. We're trying to really reinvent how people approach giving and how they feel about it and the connections that they're able to make. Mm. So 703 million, Mm -hmm. that's globally. Yeah. That's insane. Are there any particular areas that are worse than others or any specific areas that you think will move the needle much more? So it's a global issue, but it obviously affects countries that aren't as wealthy so um, in the UK we've had the industrial revolution we've had water pipes um, to our homes for as long as we can all remember but actually it's an ancient problem and it is global in the sense you'll go to some countries even um, in the US for example there'll be certain areas but that's not what we focus on because we believe they have the resources to solve that themselves what we want to do is look at where are there actually hundreds of thousands of people living rurally without access to clean water and we look at those countries so at the moment we're working 80 percent of our work is in africa 20 percent in southeast asia we'll look at those countries and say okay there's there are seven hundred thousand people without access to clean water rurally in these countries are they a stable operating environment are they welcome to outside help coming in and giving them funding um and and then we start to go from there are there partners we can really work with um and so in some places i mean we're hearing more about this issue right now because of um, some of the wars and things that are happening around the world and tragically during those scenarios people may not have access to clean water And that's a conflict issue and not something we're equipped to solve. What we're equipped to solve is where people have never had clean water, where it's been an ongoing ancient problem. Um, So that there's a whole load of countries, um, Malawi, Madagascar, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, Bangladesh, India. We're working across a whole range, 22 countries in in total that Charity Water is active in. I think as a privileged person who has never faced 
not having access to clean water, it's very hard to almost imagine what the issues are. Like, how can it even be possible that you don't have access to clean water? Yeah. I mean, I know intellectually, I know that. I yeah. see things. Yeah. Um, so I feel almost like living in a privileged world, we forget these kind of issues even exist or could be like a real blocker, not only to prosperity, but just to sheer survival. What are the main challenges of creating more clean water in these areas I think you really touched on such a valid point then is because this has been going on for so long and because it's not immediately on people's doorsteps necessarily people forget about it somebody asked me recently they said I heard about that in the 80s is that still the problem you know it's it's really hard especially how we consume news and how we look at issues and it feels like today there's these these big flare-ups around global, um, whether it's whether it is something to do with a war or people suddenly learn about an issue at the moment. Everyone's talking about you know the crisis with the post office and Horizon, and that's been a problem for so long. But it took a television series for people to really be able to relate it to themselves and think about it and actually really want to be active about it. And so it takes that storytelling. But even beyond that, with something like the post office, you can think, okay, I can really, I have a post office down my street. I know the person who runs it. I have interacted with them. I feel really close to this and that it's really something important I want to do something about. When you take that and it's, like you said, a world you really can't necessarily imagine, that's actually the biggest barrier is how do we help people to understand not only that this is is an issue, but the scale of this issue and also have them care about it enough to decide to do something about it. How do you get people to care about it? Mm. We try so many different things. And so I think the first thing is we try to break down that barrier. So it does feel, so we even have, um, we had a series on our website where you could go and you could enter a few different details about yourself. So, um, what do you enjoy doing with your free time? Do you like drinking coffee? Do you have kids? How old are you? Various things like that. And then match you with somebody else who actually lived in a village in Ethiopia and tell you why that person and you were similar. So it's called someone like you. So start to have that connection, that human-human connection. So you think, oh, actually they are, that person is is like me to a certain point. So there's there's things like that we can do, but really it's about continuing to talk, to advocate and to tell to give people the confidence, the information and the stories so they have them themselves and can spread them to their own networks. Mm. And that's what we always want people to do because of course I care about it. I talk about it. It's my day-to-day work and job and I've been at this for six years. But when somebody... I I was speaking about our email um, news that we send out recently and I was saying what I really want to be in there is something where... Um, that person goes and next time they're going out for coffee with somebody or they're gone to a dinner party or something else there's some piece of information in there that they want to share and they feel compelled to pass that information on and I want people to care about it at that level and for us to give them that not it's a sob story or anything else it's more we're empowering you to have this this level of knowledge and to know that you can actually do something about it you can, mm. you can go out you can go out and you can help to fix this and solve it mm. how did you end up with charity water what's your mm. backstory and why is this so important to you personally so it's not so when I began my career it's definitely not where I'd have thought I'd be um I started my fir- very first job was in publishing um I was an English literature graduate loved reading um was really idealistic though and, and went into that thinking about you know discovering a great writer and it's it's art form or something and then I soon realized that that publishing like like anything else it's a business um so the book the story whatever it is has to be sellable Um, It has to be a product, it has to move off shelves, it has to generate a return, it has to... So started to see the business piece behind it. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be doing business, I want to understand that properly. And I also don't want to take away from something I love, which is books. So rather than looking at that as a product, I I went and I joined um, Centrica, who are in British Gas, um, on their graduate scheme. Went into that and thought, right, I'm going to know business, business. This this will teach me. Um, and it did. It taught me all sorts of things. I, um, they were 
they were reasonably advanced in some of because they they cross over so many different areas if you think about energy it comes from 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 where you're sourcing it all the way through to how someone's using it whether it's environmental but also vulnerable customers there's this huge responsibility you have as that type of company um and when i started actually they owned a company called OneTel. We had a call centre in West London. I was on this graduate scheme, so I was only there for a few months. This is people whose job it was, and they were so good at dealing with customers. And the idea was I had to be on the phones, and we had to go on the phones to really understand in a call centre what is it like, that what we're selling, how does it work, how are we interacting with people. So I, I did that, um, and they trained me for three months, and really one of that team. And when you're on the call, and you, especially if you're dealing with a customer who's unhappy or anything, you really need those people around you. Um, you, you joke, you learn, you do everything else, and, and you form a bond. And then the next job I was moved into, which I didn't know because I was on a scheme where I was moved, was to shut down that call centre. So the same call centre? The same, same call centre. Wow. Um, and at the time, I had a boss who was... She was terrifying. She was absolutely terrifying. You would, I would come in the room, and because this is what the project we were doing, we were in an office which was in a, in a different building, like a rented office or outside, but like two buildings away. So you'd walk past the call centre, you're going to shut down, go in with her, and that was just us in this about a room about this size. And if you said good morning, she often wouldn't even respond. You know, she was just not even look at you. Not even look at you. Mm. Absolutely terrifying. Um, and she, when it came time to tell the team members that this is what we were doing, she, a friend who was, um, we were both in our early 20s at the time, and she both said to us, she tried to get us to stand up and tell the teams that we'd worked with and who had trained us that this is what was going to happen. It's not that you shouldn't take responsibility for those things and do those actions, but it wasn't ever our decision or really, you know, I was the person who was working out how the post would get from one place to another. I wasn't the person who was making the decision to, to shut this down. So we didn't, and it, it, I just found it really hard. But what I did take from that experience was the next step of it was for me to go out to India and to help train people out there. And so because I'd seen... First of all, I felt real empath empathy and, and sadness for the people who were losing their jobs in the UK. And then when I was in India, I had an amazing time, um, really loved the time I spent. I was in Bangalore, in Mumbai, um, I spent about six months in total going backwards and forwards. Um, but I also see the pr absolute privilege I was living in then. I was you know, in, a, in a nice hotel with a driver to go to an office to work with graduates who, who also had fairly nice homes they came from. But we would drive through and past um, areas where people were, you know, weeing and pooing on the street, open defecation, we call it in the industry, not having access to clean water, not having any of the things that we take for granted. And, and obviously their health and everything else was dreadfully impacted. So when I saw all of that, again, I came back to that idealistic, slightly annoying person who just kept complaining and saying, well, why aren't we doing this? What about, it? I found an orphanage, we could go and help them do that. We could do And so because I was in the position I was in and it was a company of the size it was, they said, okay, Hannah, right, if you really feel strongly about this stuff, come back and move into our diversity and our responsibility team. Um, and so I was given that opportunity to, to take it on not just a reaction to what I'd seen then and wanted to do, but actually how do you do this and how do you build it into a business of this scale and the systems and the be accountable for it and measure it and make sure you're doing it. So all of that brought me to, to where I am now in the sense of it brought me to working with charities, to understanding them, to, to seeing that. And I decided that although I think it's really important and business for good is a huge movement and I think it's what people should be doing um for me I could just never quite I never quite felt myself I never quite fit um it was it was still quite a, a number of years ago and I was told things like my earrings were too dangly or my voice was too high pitched at one point um just various things and I thought this isn't this corporate environment is not for me mm. um and I went and I left and I worked directly for charities um did that for quite a few years and started to understand that sector more and again charities also have to work like businesses so you also have to look at you know where's the money coming in where's the money going out how are you paying everybody's salaries and the product actually is is the impact and the good you're trying to do and that's really complicated and it can be really messy um and so I'd done that for a number of years and, and learned various things. And then I came across Charity Water 
and there was this really clear tangible if you give me like I said if you gave me 10 pounds now I would take that and a hundred percent of it would be spent on the clean water because we've set up a whole different new model and way of doing things um where we have gift aid and we have um philanthropists who are generally um, founders who've, who've done very well and understand business they invest in our operations so that we're able to go and have this clean giving way so for me I wanted to move into an organization which had this pure way of giving and then the great thing was water is binary you know you've achieved it you know you've got clean water so there's a there's a number of other things you can work on the charitable space around looking for cures for diseases yes you know you found it but it's a much grayer area um environmental behavior change i've worked on a lot it's much harder to to say we've achieved this or we've done Mm. this or this number of people are impacted so so on that side it's really clean um can i mm. unpack that a little bit because that's really interesting what you said about charities also have to be a business Mm. and this is something that i personally believe in as well because Mm. in order for it to be impactful it's not just having a nice idea and out of the goodness of your heart you want to help it also needs to be impactful and it is a business it needs to operate Mm -hmm. like one because you've got employees you've got people who have to perform so explain to me a little bit more you said that the operations is being funded by philanthropists Mm -hmm. and then everything else that comes into the business that is all 100% going to the causes yeah it's so Talk me through a little bit more about what the business of charity is. Like, how does it operate? Just so people can have more understanding of what happens behind the scenes. Yeah, of course. And I think really the first thing is to think of a charity it, as a business in that sense. So people will sometimes ask about if, you know, if, you, if are you paid to work for a charity, for example? And obviously, if you want to have really good people working for you, they have to be paid, not because they're, they're greedy or anything else, because they have rent or mortgages or other bills to pay. And, and so this is a, a career choice for people, and you want the really best people to come and work for you. So you, so yes, so you have people on your payroll who, who you're responsible for, and you not only want to pay them well, but you want to keep them, you want to give them a good experience, and you want them to give everything to the work that they're doing and to develop along the way and and, and do it with you. You have, um, there's often a debate within different charities as to who's your customer. Um, So usually a customer, it's very clear, they're the people who come and they give you the money for your product or your service. Um, In the the charity space, you almost have two different customers and you need to think of them both and give them both equal weighting and understand your role within that one of them is yes the person or the people who come and give you the money for the service but actually you're you tend to be delivering that service to somebody else and so you also have to treat them and give them the respect and and treat them as a customer and give them that same experience so if you're doing that what are you giving back to that first customer or the donor and so you have to work with the people you're supporting and, and who you're, we, in our case, bringing clean water to. How do we capture their stories and represent them to the donors to motivate them to want to give? And, how, and what does that, what is the transaction then for them? What are they getting from it? Um, and hopefully it is a feeling of achievement, joy, um, all, all these other things. I was just reading a study about... Um, Uh, all the different workplace well-being initiatives that are out there and there was new research that shows that actually some of them um, you know you can pay for meditation service mindfulness therapy all these other things that through the workplace they're not necessarily effective and the only thing they found that was definitely effective was when a workplace um, enabled giving and volunteering and so there is there's there's a real value but but it's different to many other businesses because we can't we can't package that up in the same way. I can't say you'll feel really good. I like your analogy of having two customers mm. and how I relate to it as being a, a headhunter that I've got mm. my candidates and I've also got my clients. And I was like, well, who's my customer? It is yes. both. It's yeah. having an understanding of the needs mm. of both. And, you know, you're kind of like this intermediary yeah. that... It's almost like a translator between the two that um, that, that analogy is really interesting. Mm. And why did you choose Charity Water? Um, so, so moving into the charity sector, it was 
about finding something that I felt really good about, to be honest. Um, and there are two causes that for me really get my, in the stomach, and in the gut. Um, one of them has always been about young kids and when they're born and those early years, if they have the same chances or not. And of course, nobody's going to have the exact same chances as another person, but how do we bring some kind of leveling equitable chance? And I just, because I just always feel so heartbroken for that child. So I worked before um, uh, on a reading initiative on helping kids with early literacy. And it was about those children who had fewer words when they started school, purely because they didn't have books at home and their parents weren't reading to them. And I always felt so heartbroken for those kids that it seemed so unfair that they would start school and already be this much further behind. So supporting young kids and as I said it's it's the leading killer of children under the age of five so for me that was like the biggest inequity I, I just can't that gets me I have to can't stand that nursery age children not have having dirty water is just not okay so for it, it ticked that box for me and then the other one has always been around women I'm one of three girls um very strong mother um just have always women's rights because it's, it's almost like it's part of who I am and what I do um and so the fact that again it's women who are really impacted by not having clean water because they're the ones who will walk for miles to get dirty water for their families they will do it time and time and time again throughout the day um and the burden and it's a real physical burden it falls on them and so when a a community gets clean water what we found, and um, we spent a lot of time talking to these, these various women, is, um, is, is a, they have more freedom in terms of um, either whether they want to build a business, if they want to, to do anything. They just have this time back, as well as health and feeling better and their kids being healthier and better. They have this time. Um, and so for me, that was those two things, the kids and the women, that mm. I really wanted to, to work on, mm. on improving lives for them. You mentioned that you're one of three girls. Mm. What was growing up like for you? Mm, it's always an interesting question. My family moved a great deal, um, which I think I was really lucky to experience. My, so my dad, my dad was always present, but he worked a lot. So he wasn't always at home and he often worked abroad. And we would move. Um, so I went to lots of different schools. We would so start, I was born in Winchester, I have no memory of it. Um, moved to Newborough and no memory of it. Then Scotland, do have a memory, started nursery school there. Then we moved to Norway. Um, then we came, I came back with my mum because her her, um, her parents were unwell and, and we stayed in Weymouth for a while. Um, and then I start to almost be like, and then where did we, you know, like I almost can't think where we moved to next, but we spent time in um, in the US, in the Middle East, in, in these various countries. Um, so my sisters and my mum were the most constant throughout that. And I'm the middle child, so um, we bickered a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what was your mum like? You're talking about having a strong example of a woman. What was she like? Well, I think what's interesting is my mum didn't work. Um, so lots of people, when they think about careers and everything else, they often look at their parents and what they've done and, and, and how they perform. So my mum wasn't working as I was growing up. And my dad um, flunked out at school and they'd been together since they were teenagers. She was 15, he was 19. Um, and he ended up going to night school and then going to university and then doing his PhD. Um, and my mum worked and financed all of that. So in some ways it looked like a very traditional upbringing um, where my mum was at home and she was, but actually it wasn't like that. My mum was the one who, um, she knew the money in, money out in the family. She would keep an eye on all of that, the accounts, everything else. She was the the manager, the I operations. would say. Yeah, the operation, she made sure everything worked. And also I always look now and I think, how did she, we moved from place to place to place. My dad would be off doing it. I don't know how she quite, it always felt fun to me. That always felt really fun. The stress in doing that. And now I have kids of my own and she'll bring out favourite books that she's kept or toys or certain pieces of clothing. And she hasn't kept everything. She's just kept, she's managed to keep really integral things. And I just think the mind to, to order all of that um, was quite phenomenal. Mm. 
I find it also interesting about like looking at your parents and seeing what, you know, one, their dynamic, two, you know, how they divide responsibilities mm. or not in, yeah, in, yeah. in some cases and what you pick up from that. I think it's interesting watching your mothers in particular for women because mm. the world has changed so much. The expectations of women of themselves mm-hmm. have changed. Society may be less so and kind of like mm-hmm. coping with that. And like, where do women fit into the society yeah. in today's world? Yeah watching women being the homemakers but also making pretty critical decisions in the home they have always been at least the coo if not oh, the ceo completely of a family yeah. and i think that's often gets ignored and bringing that back to what you're doing with charity water and looking into those dynamics in places that don't have even the basic infrastructure mm. but the cultural and the geopolitical and the physical barriers within those countries will be affecting how that unit operates women do a hell of a lot of work especially in those poorer countries Mm. i think if we empower women Mm -hmm. to be able to have the basic needs met which also then to take care of them of their own emotional needs which Mm -hmm. i imagine in those countries is probably the last thing that you're Mm -hmm. thinking about then you are in a position to raise that next generation that is emotionally financially practically stable then then masses of improvements can take place oh completely i've I've obviously worked in this space for a while last march i went to uganda um it was on a donor trip so we were taking um a actually a fashion brand um who has supported us for a long time to see some of the impact that they'd had and just to understand a bit more what it's like and um, they were particularly interested in the role of women within this and also um, that the as as an organization one of the things that they really want to influence is reducing violence against women and I've worked in this space as I say for quite a while and I hadn't understood or appreciated that actually not having access to clean water increases the chance of domestic violence and it was really I found it really heartbreaking and it it shook me quite strongly actually so we were you know we traveled into um Uganda we'd we'd gone really rural so we we, you know we'd flown flown into Entebbe then we'd got a flight you know a really small plane somewhere a bit further north then we'd driven for miles and miles on very sort of rough um not made up these red dirt roads um four-wheel drives to get as far as we could to try and meet with some of these communities um and given that we understood these these donors and their interest we'd actually asked if we could meet with the men and the women separately and it was really powerful we had these this group of women whose community had received water fairly recently and it was me two of these women from this business um a couple of my colleagues and we just sat down and had a conversation about what life was like for them and the first thing was we laughed so much that connection was really nice it was really there and you know things like sex came up all these intimate things that that I wasn't expecting but they had this real openness and when we started asking what's life like what's different one of the women did you know she, she just straight away started explaining that she felt safer and her home life with her husband was better because he no longer beat her because she wasn't spending so long collecting water and I just it's still stuck with me because I still feel like there's so much more that needs to be because I'm like okay great we've brought the clean water now culturally what happened like how do we what what happens how's this and and that's not our role um we have to be really clear to be successful we have to kind of have, have our mission and our mission is to bring the clean water and give the it's, it's like you say it's that give the woman the time and the space to hopefully be able to first of all become more economically stable and then as a family to become more economically stable and 
for that to go on for that and so and they did say these women that they were so much more help, hopeful for their daughters and for the lives that their daughters would have um and so it, it, you know it's huge that the impact of this is huge and for women it's just it gets me yeah going back to what you were saying and i don't know if you you have the answer you said you interviewed the women and you mm. interviewed the men so mm-hmm. the, the women were like okay great he doesn't beat me that you know mm. we have clean mm-hmm. water what was the men's perspective so i wasn't in the men's conversation so it was women with women and and men with men um i will say the men all had chairs <laughs> the women did not the women were sat on the ground and they'd get their things out and they had all the babies and you know everything else um i don't think they had as much to say i think what we would what i tend to find is when we go to when we travel somewhere like that and we turn up there will be quite a few men who will first of all want to talk and they will be from various bureaucratic organizations um, who want to, and, and there, there, will, there will be all of that. But to get to any truth of it, in terms of day-to-day life, the family, what this feels like and looks like, the women will answer those questions. So the men will be much more um, disconnected, I think, from that day-to-day piece, and they'll talk about, but they'll, they'll talk about the farming, um, but but that doesn't mean they're doing... The, the women and women are both doing the farming. It tends to be subsistence farming, and they're both active in it. But they will talk about that. Um, the the men I spoke to afterwards didn't have any anecdotes to repeat. They didn't, they didn't get anything new from those conversations. And they really wanted to hear, I think, so much more. So actually, I think we didn't... They said a little bit, but they, the men who didn't accompany us so that we could have this proper open conversation, they really were just fascinated by what we heard from the women because it was so much richer um, and more personal as well. Mm. I mean, it's all of these kind of cultural things that feed into it that mm. will determine the success of even your, your efforts. Mm. And I think understanding the... The culture norms Mm. also makes a big, big impact. Apart from raising awareness and getting more donations, Mm. what are the main challenges of making your mission successful? Trying to stay current. So I think it's like we talked about, there's so many issues in the world um, and so many that we all as humans care about. So when we read the news and people are experiencing violence or some of the awful things that are happening right now, we we want to help there. And it's so understandable. And I, I think what's really hard is how do I talk to people about an issue which isn't new and try to keep bringing fresh attention to it? The other piece for me is... This is a, it's a huge problem. It's also one we know how to fix. So when people are, are reading the news and feeling despondent, when people are looking at what can feel like a really divisive world, this is an issue which, first of all, people can agree on. We've never met anybody who says, do you think every human needs to have access to clean water? Nobody disagrees. So when you look at I think it's like something like half the world's population could vote this year. So if you think about the, the divisive narrative we're going to be hearing and feeling in the different camps of people there will be a cross all of those they will agree that people should have clean water so that's for me i'm like okay that helping people to see that and then trying to get them to know this is also something we know how to fix so unlike so many of these other problems you could throw all the resources all the goodwill at it unfortunately it wouldn't necessarily change hopefully there will be progress and hopefully things will shift but it's not one doesn't equal the other you can't put in a pound and generate out whereas a pound that will generate approximately 1300 liters of clean water for somebody in one of these countries I, that will be a directly invested it is a solution and we we do long-term solutions which are going to last for decades so it's trying the issue is how do we help people to try and understand it and want to care the and be current when there's so much, many other competing stories out there and then but the the opportunity is giving people that sense that they can they can do something you can really you can put in a we'll do b we get out c that like it happens it changes mm-hmm. lives apart from donating mm-hmm. what can our listeners our viewers do to support so obviously donating is amazing. Um, not everybody has the capacity, um, although as I said, one pound can make a difference. But what they can do is they can get their businesses involved. So we 
um, work with some fantastic organizations. So people like Uniqlo, um, if you go to Uniqlo and you um, need to use a paper bag, the donation from that comes to Charity Water. So choosing organizations who do that type of work, but also bringing your own organization along, trying to get, and we work with some tiny startup businesses through to, as I said, the Uniqlo's and, and some of the largest, larger brands in the world. There's that piece. And then it is about telling people as, or if this, my other piece is, if this doesn't resonate with you, if, if, if children under the age of five and, and, and sort of like the disease and things that, that burdens them does if that's not your cause and for me it is but for some people it's not then that's okay and actually but do find something right do find something which really motivates you and you care about so if you don't want to give to this give to something um but otherwise take this message and and tell people about the water crisis and that it's happening right now and it's ongoing and we can fix it and we just need everybody to pull together and we think it will be one of those we have the chance to do something really amazing and to change our world where every person has access to clean water, which hasn't happened yet. There's all these different milestones you hit at various points as the human race. And that is one we could be so proud of. We could really all do that together. And that, yeah, just to take that energy and that feeling. Mm. I'm going to ask you a question that I haven't asked for a very long time. Mm. Like what seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve it will change the course of your life or your business? Um, so it's good timing for that in the sense that so we have Charity Water's been active in the UK I started in 2018 first permanent employee um, we grew massively in 2019 with um, most people people signing up to the spring which is our monthly donation program people joined that we had our first large businesses come along and join us everything 2019 was amazing Obviously, we went into 2020 like, here we go. This is great. We are just on a winning. We'd gone from um, just over 500,000, I think, to, two, to over 2 million. So it was it was this big jump. Like, we, we are unstoppable. And we had everything planned. And then obviously, 2020, COVID hit. Um, and we are a global organization so we have to look at our costs and and we look at our we always although we don't um take any of that 100 percent and use it on our operations we have operational costs and we always look at a ratio and we hold ourselves quite highly to like okay if, if, if you know we need to raise at least four pounds for clean water for every one pound we're spending otherwise we're not doing our jobs right and when we looked at the forecast of 2020 and what could happen to us as an organization so much of our money was coming from events and things like that the team had to shrink and as the newest smallest bit of charity water the UK team was hit really hard and it was just left with just me basically to keep the lights on um and so all of this happened and we've built the team back up um it but it but having a shrinking right back down and then trying to build back up again has felt very difficult we have grown again we're back at that size we're doing everything but we know we have huge potential to do so much more um and and in the moment it feels like an an under investment in the potential in that we know the uk public um and actually across europe are very generous and they would do more if they if if we were resourced properly so we're at that time now we've just come off a strategic review with boston consulting group um they did it pro bono absolutely amazing they brought a team in they looked at how we've been fundraising what we've been doing what does this look like and so they're carving a path for us now of how to get to 20 million um and pretty fast and that's really motivating but it takes me a deep breath to go again because it feels like we would we were, we were going we were doing it and actually it's so much of starting again what we've done before so we we'll do it and it will be fabulous and it's going to work but it's just the deep breath and the go again mm-hmm. um i think covid i found particularly hard um and i know i know many people did it was the kids at home and trying to run the organization with having lost the team and then my husband's a doctor and so every morning he would you know he actually was living his best life in the sense of it was really hard but he so he's a psychiatrist so he works in a mental health hospital so they had issues with um COVID on wards and how do they manage it and how do they help people with mental health issues coming to hospitals where there's COVID. so but actually there were loads they could do and move really quickly um 
because they were able to activate in a way they hadn't before because it's like a crisis hits and you really have to adapt how you're working and what you're doing and decisions need to be made fast in an organization like the NHS that feels like something very new to have that so he was getting on his bike every day cycling off to work and I was at home and at that time with a three-year-old and a seven-year-old wow. and the organization so I so there's part of me that I just I look back and it was re- that was and then everyone clapped him every single week <laughs> they all they said how's Freddie how's Fre- oh you must be so proud how's he how is he and I'm like do you know what he is fine he is living it he's going off to work he's coming back he wouldn't even you know at first when we didn't know what's happening he'd have a shower first before he'd even talk to mm. us or do anything and I'm desperate like take the children mm. take the um, kids <laughs> I can't talk mm. um and yeah that was that was hard so if we can get through that and we can build back up which we have mm. and now uh, what I want to do is apply the multiplier effect like okay we've done this now we're going to invest here we're going to invest in doing more for the mass market and actually activating and um, increasing social media presence locally and in the UK doing that again with all our partners bringing on a lot more partners and focusing on businesses we've seen really great success when we partner with businesses how are we going to do that and do more of it we've come out of our impossible times and now it's ready to deep breath and go again mm. well I wish you all the best thank and, you you know where can our listeners find you what's the best way of reaching out and donating so charitywater.org that's it go there um we love people who give every single month because it's the most predictable way and also we're able to interact with those people and really help them to see and a bit like what you were saying about you give your money you don't know where it goes we will report back we will tell your lifetime impact how many people you've impacted some stories from those places what does it really look and feel like so please get involved come and have a look and see what we're doing Mm -hmm. hannah Thank you so much for coming onto the show. So interesting talking to you. I think, I mean, the mission is so critical Mm -hmm. and you've gone through the ups and downs and, you know, surviving and really, really going for it now. So I wish you all the very, very best because that's a very important job that you are doing. So thank you so much. Thank you for letting me be here and share it with people. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast and I'll see you in the next episode.